we can talk soon. All you have is the lifeless body of a 22-year-old. Why does someone do this? The most gut-wrenching part was seeing Heather's hand still grasping the sheet. But I just remember screaming, somebody's killed my daughter. <laughs> you have to look at these videos and hopefully gain something from it. I think everybody was crushing on Heather. Who you tell your secrets to? Now you tell your secrets to your cell phone. It was one of the most shocking videos I have ever seen in my career. I was watching the final moments of the life of Heather Nicole Maples. Twenty-two-year-old aspiring college student Heather Maples is preparing to leave her hometown in Texas to pursue her dreams in Tennessee. She loved the idea of moving to Tennessee. She just wanted to start over and do something different. My name is Jenna Holt Gomez, and Heather will always be my best friend. She knew what words to say to make you feel better. Literally five minutes of talking with Heather, and you would forget that you're even sad about anything. And Heather was really good at helping people. And I am really sorry that I didn't send you anything yesterday. And I hope you slept good and that we can talk soon. Heather Nicole Maples is born August 23, 1992, in Ocala, Florida, on the eve of a record storm. My name is Jennifer Hunter, and I am Heather Maples' mother. Hurricane Andrew was just hours away, but I had a baby during a hurricane, basically. <laughs> so she was known as my hurricane baby. I met Heather at my elementary school in Dallas, Texas. I was actually a really shy, quiet, introverted girl. I was afraid to speak to people. Heather just completely brought me out of my shell. We both tried out for cheerleading. We were so excited and so scared, but Heather wasn't afraid of anything, and we made it. In 2004, when Heather is in the seventh grade, her mom gives birth to a second child, Ryan. When he's diagnosed with a developmental disorder, Heather's focus turns to her family. All of Heather's high school years were spent with Ryan, helping Ryan learn how to talk, learn how to walk. She just immersed herself with helping to raise and take care of Ryan. When she's not caring for Ryan, Heather lives the life of a typical teenager. We spent a lot of time talking about boys. We talked a lot about what we wanted to do with our future. Heather had wanted to go to college. She was interested in pursuing a career. She decided that she was going to be a counselor. She had always been that friend. She was that listening ear because she was such a compassionate person. After graduating from high school, a friend of Heather's named Chaz unexpectedly calls and suggests she join him in Tennessee. He told her that he was in Murfreesboro and that it was a great little town. It was also a college town, and that would give her a better opportunity to be able to go to school in a local place. I remember she packed up her entire car, and I was so depressed that she was leaving, but I understood and I admired her courage. In January 2015, Heather arrives in Murfreesboro, moves in with Chaz, and embarks on a new adventure. It was a friend situation when she went, 
but I think it, it turned quickly into a boyfriend situation. When Heather first moved in with Chaz, everything was okay. And so this was just a fresh start for her. My name is Kelsey Price, and I was Heather's best friend in the state of Tennessee. My first impression of Heather was, wow. I mean, I was in awe. She just gave off this vibe, this light about her. And I said to myself, this girl's gonna be my best friend. Kelsey helps Heather land a job in the offices at the Cove apartment complex, where they both live. We worked hard, but we also had a lot of fun. We would go bar hopping, go to the mall, go shopping, get manicures, just the typical girly stuff. While Heather is thriving with work and friends, in April, her relationship with Chaz begins to crumble. Heather and her boyfriend, they split up, and he moved out, and she was able to keep her apartment so she didn't have to move again. And in early August, she phones her mother with exciting news. She was on the phone with me, and all she kept saying was, oh my gosh, mom, oh my gosh. And I was like, what? And she said, I was accepted to college. I'm going to college. And I was like, you're doing what? <laughs> She was so excited, and I was so happy for her because that was something that she did on her own. It was her proud moment. A week later, Kelsey Price opens the rental office at the Cove apartment complex and notices Heather is late for her shift. She had a tendency to, you know, sleep in, and so there were a lot of mornings where I would have to call her... About 9.15, I'm like, okay, Heather's not here. So I call a couple times. I don't get any answer. I remember her saying, if I don't answer my phone, just come get me. So when I open the door, I see her mattress, and I, I see her laying there. And I'm calling out to her. I'm like, Heather, Heather. I walk over to her, and I notice that she has a top on, but nothing else. And I'm like, gosh, she really got on one last night. So I look at her foot, I tap it, I'm like, Heather? And when I tap it, I realize it's, it's dead cold. I slowly start to back out of the apartment. I was like, just breathing and thinking like, what the you know, what the hell is going on? I called 911 and they say, what's your emergency? And I say, I think there's been a homicide here. I'm Detective Sergeant Tommy Massey with the Murfreesboro Police Department. I made my way over to the apartment complex and met with uh, Kelsey Price, who was her friend and also a, co a co-worker of hers. When I arrived on the scene, they'd already established a crime scene, had it roped off. I could see the body of Miss Maples across the bed. Obviously, she was partially nude. You could tell there was some visible trauma to her person. I immediately met with Detective Maples, the first detective from our unit to respond. My name is Detective Larry Maples. I was a detective that assisted on the Heather Maples case. There was clear evidence of a sexual assault with semen, with hair, blood. Her hair was fairly blood soaked. We were able to note that there was some cast off blood on the wall behind the uh, mattress. Obviously she had been struck on the bed and then whatever object was used to strike her had, you know, delivered blood to the wall. The most gut-wrenching part was seeing Heather's hand still grasping the sheet uh, where you could tell that she died and that she died a pretty horrific death. Why does someone do this? As the lead investigator, it's very imperative to gain as much information as quickly as you can because at that time we know nothing. 
All we have is the lifeless body of a 22-year-old girl. Detectives search for clues in Heather's final moments. With a crime of this nature, it was very conceivable that this was going to be a little more on Heather's private life. Friends become suspects. There was no force entry to the door, so it didn't appear to be a random act. And a window opens to a horrifying world. It was one of the most shocking videos I have ever seen in my career. When investigators discover 22-year-old Heather Maples murdered in her own apartment, they begin processing the scene. There were several identifiers on Heather's body that were significant to us. There was, uh, you know, semen. There was a presence of hair we believe was not Heather's hair. As forensics begins processing evidence for DNA testing, investigators make another discovery. To the right of Miss Maples, there was a bloody fingerprint at the top of the bed that was pristine. You could not have taken ink and rolled that fingerprint and had a better print. There was nothing consistent with that fingerprint to lead us to believe that it was Heather's, nor was there any conceivable way that her hands would have been placed there. Investigators process the print to compare to potential suspects and to submit to a national fingerprint database. And soon, they make another discovery. We were able to recover Ms. Maple's cell phone at the scene. Without a passcode, however, they can't open the device. As they set out to gain access to the phone, they observe something else. We also noted that the windows were closed or locked. So the only way in was through that one front door. So no one forced their way inside. So it didn't appear to be a random act at that point. Heather's body is transferred to the coroner's office for further examination. With the support of Heather's best friend, Kelsey, Detective Massey then embarks on a harrowing task. One of the most difficult things to do is the death notification to someone's family that their loved one is deceased. I wanted to be the one to tell her. I wanted it to be from somebody who loved Heather and cared about her. So I called and I, I just said, Jennifer, are you sitting down? I remember her just telling me that Heather's gone. And I was like, where, where is Heather? Because I knew Heather was supposed to be at work. And then she said, Heather is dead. I just remember screaming, no, somebody's killed my daughter. <laughs> but, but it wasn't real. It didn't seem real. In his conversation with Jennifer, Detective Massey learns that the last time she saw her daughter was six days ago, when they spent the afternoon together in Texas. She just called about a week or two before and said, hey, I've got tickets, I'm coming home for this weekend. It was great to see her. Heather and I were together. I dropped her off at her friend's house and I gave her a hug and a kiss and told her I loved her. I had no idea that that was going to be the last time I was ever going to hold my daughter. Back at the crime scene, Massey speaks to Kelsey about Heather's living situation and discovers that her relationship with her ex-boyfriend, Chaz, has been tumultuous. There had been allegations of abuse. I would hear her telling me about how he's got anger issues and he was abusing her. It was a pretty scary thing because she called me. She was really upset and she didn't know what to do. I told her to leave and come back home. But she was determined to really make something of herself. And there were often times where I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to have to go over here and intervene 
but I helped her get a restraining order. I pretty much just took her under my wing from there on out. He becomes someone we wanted to have a conversation with uh, about her death. Did something trigger him? Was this a, an act of aggression? And those are some things we wanted to know. Before police can track down Chaz, something unexpected happens at the crime scene. A young man came just about bursting through the crime scene. His name was Michael, and he was very determined to either get inside that tape, get inside that scene. It's not uncommon in some cases that you will have suspects come back to the scene and interject themselves into the investigation. Michael also shares an alarming piece of information. The interesting part was that he had Heather's keys. No one forced themselves into her apartment, and she's dead. So certainly, that's somebody we want to have a conversation with. And uh, we uh, got him back to, the, to our offices pretty quick. He seemed pretty upset and despondent over the fact that his friend was deceased. How do you know Heather? I met her at the bar. This is going to be rude, but i got to ask it because that sometimes details are important, sometimes you're not. The first night you met her, did you have sex with her? I did not. I've never had any contact other than how I've never even kissed her. So you've you never had sex with her? No, ever. Okay. Michael may have had a little crush on her, but at the same time, he had a girlfriend. And I don't know if he ever acted on any of his feelings. Michael then reveals that before Heather was murdered, he spent much of the evening with her. What was the story on that? Yesterday, she um, asked me if I was off work because she said she was hungry. I was like, cool, let's go to old Chicago. Went to old Chicago. According to Michael, after dinner, he went home while Heather went to a local bar with friends. But later that evening, she reached out for help. She called me at 11.40. So at 11.40 she calls you? Yes. And so she tells me that I need to come to the bar. She really needs me right now. There's people hitting on her and she's really upset. And I was like, okay, I'll be there. We learned from Michael in the interview, there was a situation where she was being, if you want to call it, harassed by the young man by the name of Artavio. He was following her around and touching her. I was like, man, why don't you leave her alone? Michael had some concern about because he felt like he was being a little too, I guess, pushy with Miss Maples that night in the bar about trying to maybe have some advances toward her. Shortly after the incident, Michael suggested taking Heather home. We walk out the door. She's like, hey, I want to go to the bar. I'm hungry. Will you take me there? said sure she orders biscuit gravy eggs two eggs and sausage and we sat there when she was done i drove her to her apartment dropped her off i watched her walk up the stairs and she was like okay he estimated that time to be approximately 2 30 a.m the morning of August 7th, and that that was the last that he saw her. Her door had to have been unlocked, though. Why? Because she had her keys. Because she didn't have any pockets or anything in her dress. And you forgot to give them back or you dropped her off. Right. Investigators take Michael's fingerprints and a DNA sample and set out to determine if he's been truthful about his evening with Heather. We had ideas where she was, but again, knowing where she was and knowing what she's doing while she's there are very different things. We wanted to retrieve the video from handlebars. They'd been out there to eat, and that was their last stop before he drove her home. The investigators pull the footage in question for insight into what may be Heather's final moments. We watch it in real time, just like you would a movie. You have to look at these videos and hopefully to gain something from it. Investigators are reviewing security footage of Heather Maples and her friend Michael 
from the early morning hours of the night she was murdered. We're able to piece together through that evidence that she had been with Michael. We were interested to see what would happen next. While Michael seems comfortable showing Heather affection, the pair's time at the diner seems to match his account to police. But what happens after they leave remains a mystery. Because Michael was the last person that we knew of to see Heather Nicole Maples live, he was someone that the police were very interested in. After reviewing the footage, investigators turned to the medical examiner's report for additional clues. They had ruled that the death was a homicide. And that the cause of death was strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. The rape kit provided them with a DNA sample. That DNA sample was forwarded to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Crime Laboratory for analysis. When we did get the return of the fingerprint and we got the return of the DNA, Michael was determined not to be a match to any of the identifiers that were at the scene. With Michael cleared as a suspect, detectives begin looking into the man he described from the bar that night, Artavio. But then they uncover new information about Heather's ex-boyfriend, Chaz, who she filed a restraining order against a few months back. We learned that he had moved, but that he was actually back in town the night of her murder, which piqued our interest even more. We just went in and, and conducted the interview. While he acknowledges his relationship with Heather was rocky, Chaz denies having anything to do with her murder. He said he hadn't been to her apartment in months. He gave us key details of where they'd been throughout the night. We were able to verify the alibi he provided us, and the time frame just didn't really fit what it would have required to have committed the crime. At the end of the interview, we asked him to consent to DNA. He agreed to do that. With that interview, you know, we were able to determine that he was not there, that they really had not had any contact, and that uh, was later cleared uh, when the DNA came back. Later that day, with two potential suspects quickly cleared, investigators turned back to Heather's best friend, Kelsey. I felt like a suspect because I was the one who found her. And you describe her as your best friend, right? Correct. Um, what was Heather's lifestyle? Was she a big drinker? She liked to smoke a joint? She take pills? Was, was she promiscuous? She liked to drink. They wanted to get as much information about her and her life as they could. They wanted to know about sex lives. I mean, everything. According to Kelsey, after splitting up with Chaz, Heather's social world expanded. She immediately was so happy, so free. She could really spread her wings and fly at this point. She was just very charismatic. I think everybody was crushing on Heather. I mean, literally, she was like a boy magnet. She had men around her all the time, you know, staring and wanting. Kelsey begins listing off anyone of note that Heather has been talking to over the last few weeks. I told them about Brandon. She just met him and his roommate one night, not too long before that. She introduced me to them. That was the only time I had ever met them, and I never thought about it again, really. Through the interview process, we knew we had a Brandon that she was hanging out with, but with a question mark, because no one even really knew who he was. He stayed on our radar. I'm in Texas, and I don't know any of these people. So we're kind of stunned. Did Heather make friends with somebody who would kill her? We had no idea. Investigators then turned their questioning to the night of Heather's murder. Okay, so um, 
during last night, which is Thursday night, do you text her, hear from her, talk to her? Any? I snap. We she Snapchatted me. I woke up and got a drink of water or something, and I saw that she had sent me a Snapchat. And um, the Snapchat was a picture of her and Artavio at the bar. They both look, you know, like they've been having fun. And so I just, I went back to bed. That was the last thing that I ever received from Heather. Yeah, that was it. One of the concerns to us was the Artavio gentleman because he had been with her that night. There had been a photograph of that. What can you tell me about him? Um, I don't know a whole lot about him. He seems like a very nice guy. He's funny. Um, you got any idea why she would send you a picture of her and Octavio, why that's a big deal? Um, they're pretty, I mean, I think she thinks they're pretty good friends. Okay. Like. It's conceivable that her suspect could likely be in her phone. Who do you tell your secrets to? Now you tell your secrets to your cell phone. Having not yet gained access to Heather's device, detectives turned to Kelsey for help. The detectives said, we've tried everybody. We've tried Heather's mom to get her passcode. Do you know it? And I said, yeah, actually, I do. I was the only person who knew it. So they were elated. When we went through Heather's phone, we were able to start piecing together a timeline of her last few minutes. Around the same time Michael claims he dropped her off, Heather sent a message to a name that investigators recognize. She did have a text message in the late morning hours that uh, she had reached out to that gentleman, Artavio, asking him to come over to the apartment. Did he drive over and kill her? When investigators examine Heather Maple's phone, they discover she texted her friend, Artavio, inviting him to her apartment hours before she was found murdered. That was one of the last ones she sent out. At least we know she was alive at this time because she reached out to him, that he could have been the last person with her. We wanted to talk to him in case he was involved. Artavio did know Heather. I don't know the depth of that relationship. We knew that, that he had been with Heather throughout the night. Okay, all right. What did you do yesterday afternoon? I went and hung out with Heather. We drank some tequila, and then we went to gyms for a while. Okay, and who was Heather? Uh, a friend of mine. <laughs> we pulled him in to interview him. We realized that he didn't know that she had died. And so we used it to our advantage to see if, is it going to change his answers to the questions. I'll show you a picture, okay? Do you have any idea when that would have been taken? It was a little bit before we left to go to gyms. Who took that picture? She took it. Do you know if it was posted or sent to anybody? Uh, it was on Snapchat. Massey then asks about Heather's late night text. If Heather says that you came back over after she got home, would we believe that not to be true? Yeah, I didn't show back up over there. If she texts it, Heather texts me at like 2.30 or something. Can I see the text? Yeah. But I was already asleep. I saw it this morning. Sometimes a lie is just as good as the truth. If you provide me with certain names of people you were with or locations you were at, and we can't verify that, then why would you be dishonest or untruthful in a case like this? People saw you go in the apartment. Phone records put you at the apartment. You were with her yesterday. Your picture was with her, okay? Because here's what I'm going to tell you at this point, Tay. I believe she texted you to come back over there. You went over there, and then something happened. No. And not only was this girl raped, she's dead. What? No way. This way, okay? And here's what I'm going to tell you. There's DNA all over that girl. It's going to come back, I believe, to one Mr. Tate. Oh, I'll come back to me. 
once the interview had concluded, we asked him if he would submit to a DNA test. He provided uh, you know, buccal swabs uh, that we collected. As detectives wait for the lab results, they investigate Artavio's version of events. As we say, everybody's a suspect until they're not. But we were able to determine that he did not respond because he had actually been with someone else, which made it easier to corroborate his story. So we had to mark him off the list as a suspect at that time. But at the same token, you're like, oh, that's kind of bad. Not right now, we're back to square one again. Over the next few days, detectives circle back to Heather's list of friends in search of new leads. And one name keeps coming up. You got the mysterious Brandon guy from the bar, you know. Could he have something to do with it? And could he have known where she lived? Could he be involved? And it was interesting looking at everyone's notes where Brandon was written down or Brandon that was circled. And then later Brandon was circled twice. But something puzzles investigators. With all the accounts of that night, Brandon has never been placed with Heather. We didn't feel like we were at a total dead end, but we'd worked pretty much for seven straight days nonstop on this case. Hadn't taken very many breaks, hadn't slept a lot. Every day we had calls with the detective. He was very good at keeping us up to date. But it almost feels like you're living one of those TV shows. I was angry, I was sad, I was frustrated. It's amazing how that relationship with a victim's family can drive you when you're tired, fatigued, frustrated. We worked for Jennifer at that point, and we wanted to make sure that we did everything that we could to make sure that at some point she could find peace. On the eighth day of the investigation, as Detective Massey prepares to leave the office, his plans are interrupted. That afternoon, I got a phone call from one of the directors down at the TBI crime lab. We had received a hit on the fingerprint that was submitted from the bed. It belonged to the mysterious Brandon. His fingerprints had been previously submitted into the APHIS system by a company that he was seeking employment with and that they had had a match to the one we had submitted from the bloody fingerprint on the bed. Once we got that fingerprint back, now all of a sudden this Brandon came into full focus and became the center of the investigation. Where does he work? Is he going to school? Who is Brandon? Eight days after finding Heather Maple's body, police discover that a man named Brandon Bowling left a critical clue on Heather's bed. So at that point, we knew that we were on to at least somebody that was there. So we spent that afternoon researching who is Brandon Bowling, where does Brandon Bowling live, how do we find Brandon Bowling. We were able to ascertain that he was employed as a driver at one of the local food establishments. He was actually working that night. I met him in the parking lot told him we were working on a homicide of Miss Heather Maples. We asked him if he'd be willing to come to the police department and talk to us. Uh, what was his name? 14. Uh, how do you know Heather? We met at Jim's. Do you know when that was? Uh, maybe three, three or four months. There are different ways to interview different people. Sometimes you have to be gentle with them, you know. I tried every technique you could, you know, to be his friend almost, to give him opportunity to have an out as to why it happened. Ever been to her apartment? I have been to her apartment. The times you had gone over there, did she have to let you in, or was the door unlocked, or do you remember? I think she, like, usually left her door unlocked, so... Let me ask you this, have you ever been sexually intimate with her? The first night? No, no, second night. Second time I met her. You hooked up with her? Yeah, we did. 
What's the last time you were in her apartment? That might have been in July. At that point, we knew, obviously, he wasn't telling the truth because there's no way his bloody fingerprint gets there on that, on that bed sheet that night if he's not been there in two months. And it was still wet when we actually got on the scene. Once we confronted him with physical evidence, you could see his demeanor change, his shoulders drop, uh, head drops. You know you were there. You know what happened. So now you need to tell me so that I can understand. I don't know I was there. I don't know I was there. That's the thing. Okay, well then how did your bloody fingerprint get don't. on the bed? There's no way I did anything. She was, she just got accepted into college. Like, I was happy for that. It seemed like he was starting to gather, collect the fact that, you know, he's had, that, that we, we know it, we've got it. I don't believe you don't remember what happened. <laughs> Look at me, young man, so this is important. They can put you to death. Do you understand? Okay. Because this is the most important conversation you had in your life. The only way your bloody fingerprint got there is your hands bloody. And you had your hands on her while you were raping her. Well, then tell me what happened. I thought several times throughout my interview with him, like he was on the verge of confessing. But he never would. He never would come off of anything other than he'd not been there. At the end of the interview, we asked him to consent to DNA because we told him it could clear the case if he wasn't truly there. And I want you to just take one at a time. You're going to basically stick it on first on your right cheek, swirl it around. While investigators await the results of the test, based on the strength of the fingerprint evidence, they make their move. After he basically would not tell us anything that we needed to know. Well, I'm going to tell you what. At this time, Brandon, you're being charged with first degree murder and the death of Heather Maples. Okay? He was subsequently charged with uh, first degree murder that night. To build their case, police file a subpoena to access Brandon's phone. Detective Massey then makes a call. It was uplifting calling Miss Hunter and telling her, I just booked the man into jail that may have murdered your daughter. Because at least at some point, maybe she found comfort in that. Detective Massey called me to let me know that he had caught someone. And it was a sigh of relief. But again, we had no idea who he was or why did he do it. I mean, that's the one question that I still have is why. I still don't know. When investigators gain access to Brandon's phone, however, they gain chilling insight into his motive. This is a perfect example of the things you can't unsee. What was in that phone will be with us for the rest of our lives. As investigators scan through the phone of their chief suspect, Brandon Bowling, they make a horrifying discovery. The video from the cell phone of Brandon Richmond Bowling was one of the most shocking videos I have ever seen in my career. You could see the room of Heather Nicole Maples. You could see the bed. You could see Heather Nicole Maples being raped. And you knew that at this time she was alive. It was obvious she had been beaten and she was suffering. The thing that struck me the most was that I was watching the final moments of the life of Heather Nicole Maples. As parents, you want to know what happened to your child. 
So you have to ask the question, how did, how did she die? And be careful what you ask for, because the answer you get is horrifying. It's awful. And I think about how lucky we were to get a bloody fingerprint on a bed. Had we not got the fingerprint back, I don't know. Maybe we would have caught him. Maybe we wouldn't have. I don't know. There's always the possibility that we wouldn't have. And maybe somewhere down the line continue to do what he did. In February 2018, Brandon Bowling pleads guilty to the murder and rape of Heather Maples. He is sentenced to 40 years in prison without the possibility of parole. The day that the plea deal was signed, I read a victim impact statement. I viewed that statement as the last time that I would be able to speak for my child and what her loss meant to us. I forgive Brandon Bolton for killing my daughter. From that day forward, I learned, don't worry about anything and pray about everything. It in no way meant that I forgot what he had done. I'm supposed to forgive, and so that's what I did. I tell you, there was hardly a dry in that, in that courtroom. Once the hearing was over, we went out into the hallway, and his mother walked over to me. She was heartbroken. I was heartbroken, and I just gave her a hug. And we both lost our kids that day. I wanted her to know that I understood her pain. Years later, Jennifer remembers her daughter's last trip back to Texas and her final moments. So it was great to see her, that her accomplishments that she had been working on were coming to fruition. She was happy. You know, I can look through videos and I can look through pictures and she's smiling. You know, there was always a light there for her, for me. She was an amazing person, a contagiously, beautifully incredible person. Our last time together was at the office, at work, the night that she went out. We got off at about five. We walked home together. And that walk home was the last walk home I ever got with her. She's, she's definitely forever in my heart and in my mind all day, all the time. I can never forget her. She's literally one of the best friends that I've ever had. If you love somebody, you got to hold them tight because you never know when your last day with them is. I love you. And that's the last words that I ever spoke to. We didn't know what had happened. Kelsey was just gone. The clock's ticking. We were just praying she's still alive. You see a flash of a figure come up from behind her. Kelsey's not necessarily all alone. It's just like your heart just drops. Just tell me where her phone is. Just 
Just where is it? Pardon my French. It was really an oh moment. May 25th, 2007, Overland Park, Kansas. 18-year-old Kelsey Smith is graduating from Shawnee Mission West High School. I remember the day clearly when Kelsey graduated. We were very proud of her. My name is Missy Smith, and Kelsey Smith is my daughter. Her boyfriend, John, had an air horn, and when she walked across the stage, he had hit the air horn. There was a lot of noise and clapping and stuff. The principal asked her, is that your hooligan family? And she was laughing and said, yeah, that's them. I'm Greg Smith, and I'm Kelsey's dad. And I was happy that she graduated. I was happy that she hit that milestone. It was a neat night. To, to see that. Kelsey was born May 3rd, 1989. She was our third daughter. She was very inquisitive. She got the nickname Nono because she was always into things. Kelsey was very, very outgoing, even at a young age. We had five kids. She was the middle child, so she went out of her way, I think, to be noticed. I met Kelsey in middle school. She was very loud. And at first I thought she was kind of bossy, but like not in a bad way. (laughs) I'm Megan Lang. I'm Kelsey's best friend. We were in marching band together. We both played clarinet. It was a lot of fun. Every year the marching band played at halftime at the football game. She took a lot of pride in that. During her senior year, Kelsey's life changes when she meets her high school sweetheart, John. When she first met him, she's like, hey, there's this guy, and he is so cute, and he's just awesome. And I was like, oh, cool. John was over at our house all the time once they started dating, I mean, all the time. They went to senior prom together. We all got a limo. Kelsey had this big, beautiful yellow dress that looked just like the Disney princess, Belle. And we had so much fun. After graduation, Kelsey and me were super excited to go to K-State. I had always assumed that Kelsey would go to Kansas University because John was going to KU for college. And I told my wife, who do you want to bet moves first? Is it going to be Kelsey or John that changes schools? On June 2nd, a week after her high school graduation, Kelsey is excited and getting ready for a big date. She and John were going to go out that night. It was their six-month anniversary, which I had no idea was a thing. But apparently when you're 18, it's a big deal. Kelsey said that she had to go to Target to get a gift for John before they went out that night. And while she was there, she talked to her mother, Missy, on the cell phone. It was about 7 o'clock in the evening. Kelsey had called me to ask me about the gift she was looking for for John. There was this scrapbook box that she wanted to find for him because she had given him a card and his mom accidentally threw it away not knowing that it was important to him and it really upset him. So I was explaining to her which aisle she could find this box that she was looking for at Target. She was just in a hurry to get home because she was meeting John for dinner. And then um, I said to her, uh, I said, bye baby. I'll see you when I get home. I love you. And that's the last words that I ever spoke to her. A short time later, a little after 7 p.m., Kelsey's boyfriend arrives at the Smith family's home. 
John came over to the house to pick her up for the date. He was so excited, but Kelsey wasn't there. Um, started calling and texting. But she's just not answering, and I just knew something was bad. A veteran police officer, Kelsey's father doesn't waste any time trying to find her. Kelsey's older sister, Lindsay, and John got in a car and went out looking for Kelsey. In the meantime, I started calling police departments and asking, hey, have, have you had any accidents or traffic stops with this car or whatever? And I remember Lindsay calling and saying, hey, Dad, we found her car. It wasn't at Target. It was at Oak Park Mall across the street. Kelsey wasn't there. It was just her car. We knew something was wrong. And then Lindsay said, John wants to get inside and look around. I said, I don't care if you have to tackle him. Don't let him touch the car. I'm calling the police. Patrol officers respond to the call at 10 p.m. I'm retired Detective Sergeant Bob Miller with the Overland Park, Kansas Police Department. Kelsey's car was located on the opposite side of the mall, uh, a good third of a mile from Target. The mall was closed, and it wasn't even parked in a parking stall. It was just kind of parked in a dark spot. After the police met us, and they immediately treated the car like it was a crime scene. Her purse was found in the car, but her cell phone and car keys were missing. The shopping bag from Target was in there, which just adds to the strangeness and the urgency of the whole thing. And then the police noticed something was hanging out of the trunk. It was like a paper strap or, or something. It, it set off all kinds of alarm bells. My fear was she was in the trunk. Watching them open the trunk of her car, as a mom, it's just agony. I'm just sitting there holding on to Greg, and he wouldn't let me watch them open up. She wasn't in there. And then when she wasn't, you're just like, where the hell is my kid? The car was towed to the Johnson County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab where they started processing for fingerprints and for DNA. And then the police asked us to come down to the station to be interviewed. I'm Detective Candace Bridges, and I work the Kelsey Smith case. When I first arrived at the station, Kelsey's family was there. Her boyfriend, John, was there as well. Everyone was on a heightened sense of alert. Kelsey was, by all accounts, a good kid. Her father, Greg, was a law enforcement officer himself, so he knew when to raise a red flag to let us know this was something serious. They brought us into an interview room, sat us down in there, walked out, closed the door. I looked at Missy and I said, you know why we're here, right? I said, we're suspects. The Smiths tell police that Kelsey left for Target around 6.30 p.m. and was supposed to meet John sometime after 7. But she never showed. The timeline lets us know what she did before she went missing which may sometimes hold the key as to why she was missing. And that became more important when we interviewed John a little bit later. John told us Kelsey's very excited about going off to college. But what John says next catches investigators by surprise. John told us they were going to split up when they went to college. That's a highly emotional situation between John and Kelsey. We asked... Was she upset? Was she upset with him? At that point, we were thinking, John did something to her. The race to find Kelsey. First 24 hours passed, and you become more anxious. 
clues buried in Telsey's final moments. We just, we were dumbfounded. I just lost it. I just, I just fell apart. And a suspect's chilling statement. And he goes, yeah, I saw her. She had great legs. And just my skin started crawling at that point. Kansas police are questioning the boyfriend of a missing teen, Kelsey Smith. At that point, we were thinking she's upset at her boyfriend, John, or John did something to her. We asked John, did he know anything that might um, tell us where she had gone? We went pretty hard at John with the questioning. Because clock's ticking. But John says he has no idea where she is or why she never showed up for their date that evening. And then John showed us his phone. We were surprised. I mean, kids don't like to show their phones. We learned that he was texting Kelsey's phone and trying to get her to answer. We expected at least something from her saying, not now, or, you know, something to turn him off or shut him down. But there was nothing. To validate the story, Investigators request John's cell phone records, which confirm that he was, in fact, waiting for Kelsey at her home at the time she went missing. So that's pretty much what helped us clear John. Authorities request Kelsey's cell phone records as well. We wanted to know the last calls that Kelsey had made. Had she talked to somebody? Had somebody called her? So we set out to get her phone records but we were told they were unavailable because they would require upper management to release them. And as the wife of a police officer, I just found it unbelievable that I had so many obstacles. The phone was in my name. There was no reason for them to not do it. Just tell me where her phone is. Just, just where is it? Next, detectives head to the site of Kelsey's last known location. The Target store didn't open until, gosh, 10 or 11 o'clock on Sunday, the next morning. So we called Target, and they opened the store for us and let us see the CCTV footage. We're watching this video on the small computer screen. And we watched Kelsey She parked and went inside. So now we know that Kelsey did make it to Target. She was there and she was safe and going about her business, doing her shopping. We see Kelsey walk around the store, collect the items that she was purchasing. She was on the phone with her mom. She talks to Missy for just a few more seconds, hangs up the phone. She pays for her items, and we see Kelsey exit the store. The video shows Kelsey walking out through the doors, and then the next view is the camera in the corner of the parking lot near where her car is parked. The outside video shows Kelsey walking to her car, putting her items in the passenger side door, and getting in the driver's side door, then she drives away. And that's the last time you see the car. Everything looked normal, just business as usual. But investigators can't rule out something more sinister. We couldn't say for sure that we had a missing person taken against their will or if we just had a young lady who wasn't ready to be found yet. Will this fleeting glimpse of Kelsey offer any clues to help find her? We went on with the investigation because we had a girl to find. At the time, the family had already started searching the neighborhood. We still have no idea where Kelsey is, and that was a really scary feeling. That first day, we all took out flyers and hung them around businesses. 
going door to door and searching. Hundreds of volunteers will set out again today, passing out flyers looking for Kelsey. I kind of just went on autopilot. I was also mostly running on energy drinks and no sleep, and <laughs> it was a mess. While the search for Kelsey continues, detectives are busy following up on their next lead. The next morning, when the Macy's store opened, we obtained their video footage of the parking lot where Kelsey's car had been found late the previous evening. It is VHS tape, so it was pretty poor quality. It's so grainy and it's dark, and the only light in the picture is the low watt lighting in the parking lot. And then a little bit after 9 p.m., you see the headlights of Kelsey's car coming in and then parks in the dark. Then you see the door open. A figure that you can't exactly make out gets out of the car and walks away. We could tell that it wasn't Kelsey that got out of that car and walked off camera. You could just see the way they walked. It wasn't the gait of a teenage girl. Investigators believe the figure is male. So that was a surprise to us. We just, we were dumbfounded. After Kansas teenager Kelsey Smith goes shopping, she never returns home to her family. It wasn't considered officially a, an abduction or a missing person. It's just she hadn't come back. Um, suspicious circumstances. I remember in the morning after the first day that she was missing, I remember getting up and, and going in the shower and I just I just lost it. I just, I just fell apart. Um, that, that was really hard. It wasn't readily apparent what had happened to Kelsey. But the day after her disappearance, investigators observe something disturbing. Surveillance footage of an unidentified man parking Kelsey's car two hours after she went missing. So we knew right away that kind of ingrains a, an acquired sense of suspicion. Authorities then give added scrutiny to the footage that may contain Kelsey's final moments in search of any sign of the male figure seen driving Kelsey's car. My boss was a big tech guy, so we had a big command center with all these big Proxima projectors, and you could blow it up on a wall that was 15 by 12. Rather than viewing it on a CCTV screen, which is a smaller screen, this time we watched it again with a different perspective. She goes to the store, she comes out the doors, and she's walking to her car. She puts her items in the passenger door, and then walks around the back of her car. We expected to see her get in the car, back out, and drive away, just like we had seen on that small computer screen. Then, just a split second before she shut the door, you saw a flash. The second you saw that flash on the video, I felt that rush, you know. The room got very hot. At that moment, I believe all of us stopped breathing. You could have heard a pin drop. I remember turning to someone and saying, did you see what I saw? As Kelsey's opening her driver's side door, you see a flash of a figure wearing a white shirt and dark colored pants come up from behind her. 
It's very small. It's very hard to see. It's blurry. We believe the blurry figure was forcing Kelsey into her car. We then knew this was much more serious than we thought. Pardon my French, it was really an oh moment. At that point, we realized we had an abduction. But police still need to figure out who abducted her and why. By piecing together the collection of Kelsey's final moments, investigators hope to uncover what happened. We went back to the inside target video and watched it again to see if we could spot anybody wearing a white shirt and dark colored pants. We literally watched everything frame by frame. I forget how many hours of footage Target gave us. Hundreds. It was just, it was overwhelming. What we discovered is Kelsey's not all alone inside the store. She's being watched. When Kelsey enters the frame, shortly after you see this male enter the frame behind her, and this happens repeatedly. Every time Kelsey walks down an aisle, you see him walk down the aisle. He's watching her. You've seen the National Geographic shows where the predator is circling. That's what you see. You see the suspect looking, and he walks past the aisle where Kelsey's at, and he locks. I mean, his head snaps, and he locks. Unfortunately, Kelsey's preoccupied. She's talking on the phone, and she's just not aware of what's going on. He sees Kelsey move towards the checkout lane. As Kelsey's paying, he exits the store. The camera angle's perfect as he's walking out the door. You can tell he's in his 20s. He's got a goatee. At that point, we knew we wanted to identify this person. I remember Greg and I going to the command center and them showing us the footage. Once the video actually revealed that it was a kidnapping, it was just like your heart just drops. The only thing that was really going through my mind was, he knows where my child is. I needed them to find him so I could find her. We were just praying that she's still alive. An officer, racked by guilt, vows to make amends. I was only 600 feet away when she was kidnapped. And uh, Andy thinks that he should have been able to stop it. He's hundreds of yards away. Critical clues across state lines. Captain Fredrickson said, you need to brace yourself. I was shocked, and I think... All of us were kind of panicked at that point. Leading to an explosive encounter with their prime suspect. It was just, he was livid. And that's when he screamed in my face. He said, this is all you got. After combing through surveillance footage, investigators identify a suspicious white male who was following Kelsey Smith and may have even kidnapped her. Once we identified our suspect, we went to the media to help us find him. Police are chasing hundreds of leads looking for this man, a person of interest, they say, seen on the same store camera leaving Target moments before Kelsey. I was shocked, and I think all of us were kind of panicked at that point. As Kelsey's story quickly becomes national news, one local in the community is working hard to help find her. I'm Officer Andy Black of the Oakland Park, Kansas Police Department. I was the liaison officer for Oak Park Mall, and on the day of this case, I was actually working there off duty. The evening Kelsey disappeared, I was doing the habit of smoking a cigar, taking a break outside the corner of the building, and that's when it happened. I was only 600 feet away when she was kidnapped. And 
and uh, Andy thinks that he should have been able to stop it. And he's hundreds of yards away. Nobody anywhere expects him to see what's going on and be able to intervene. But um, to this day, I think he still blames himself. It weighs heavy on me. I just wish we would have caught him. Plagued by guilt and determined to find Kelsey, Officer Black volunteers to work the tip line. As soon as the suspect comes on the TV and throws up the 800 number, we're overwhelmed with a huge amount of calls. But the majority of them weren't valid. As calls continue to come in, one tip stands out. We got multiple calls on an individual by the name of Edwin Hall. That name went into the log of all the other names that we had gathered from the tips hotline to track down and investigate. The first thing that we do whenever we got a name is we see if we can find a driver's license photo of that person so that we can indeed verify if they match the description of who we're looking for. And Edwin very much matched the description of the person from the target video. So Edwin Hall was put to the top of the list. He was a local resident with a couple of different addresses on file. We ended up going to an old address that he no longer lived at. So we couldn't find him. But law enforcement soon homes in on another suspect. We got several calls calling in to say that that individual resembled someone they knew by the name of Jack. As you can imagine, just having the name Jack in a metro of over a million people, that's not necessarily going to be your best lead <laughs> to track down. Authorities have two potential suspects but can't track either one of them down. Then on June 6th, three days after Kelsey's kidnapping, investigators catch a break when another tip comes in to Officer Andy Black. I got a call from a lady and she said, uh, I know that guy. She told me that he went by the name of Jack and he lived in the city of Olathe. Once authorities receive Jack's address, they immediately head to his home. When they arrive, they're surprised by what they find. As they pulled up, they see this person packing boxes into the back of this vehicle, looking like they're getting ready to leave. The man confirms that his name is indeed Jack, and tells detectives that he was just getting ready to leave with his wife and four-year-old son on a trip. We didn't want to take the chance that he was going to skip town. So at this point, the suspect actually willingly comes into the station. With the clock ticking, authorities now only hope that they've caught the right suspect. I got a phone call from my boss saying, hey, this guy, Jack, He's coming in for an interview. I need you back here now. So we were beelining back to the station. Four days after the abduction of Kansas teenager Kelsey Smith, authorities tracked down a 26-year-old suspect named Jack. When questioned, he reveals something surprising. As he's being interviewed by investigators, he admits that he goes by the name Jack. That is his uh, nickname that he's given himself. And then he gave his birth name, Evan Hall. So that was a surprise to us. Investigators realized that Edwin Hall is the same person that the tip line had received numerous calls about and that detectives have been trying to track down. It all started falling into place as to 
This was our person that we were looking for. And then that's when they started with some very pointed questions. Detective Miller shows Edwin a picture of Kelsey in order to gauge his reaction. Edwin denied ever seeing Kelsey, but then we showed him the surveillance footage, and at that time, he says he's the guy on the video. While Edwin acknowledges going to the store, he insists he's never seen Kelsey. So he offered up DNA, fingerprints, anything he could do to help eliminate himself, which was quite surprising. And the county took those fingerprint cards and his DNA swabs. Despite Hull's willingness to provide evidence, Detective Miller persists. We went back in, and I basically just put her picture on the table. It was the picture of Kelsey inside Target. And I mentioned to Edwin, I said, so you never saw her? Very attractive young lady, you know. I'd give her a second look, you know, so I kind of went locker room talk with him, and he bit. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I saw her. She had great legs. And just my skin started crawling at that point. He claimed he noticed Kelsey, thought she was pretty, and watched her, but then also claimed he left and never saw her again, doesn't know what happened to her. And I said, now you're saying you saw her. Why didn't you tell us that before? But a smug Edwin refuses to answer. In order to charge him, Detective Miller needs more evidence. I knew he was lying, but he's going to be let go. In the meantime, investigators catch an unexpected break when a waitress calls the tip line, saying she recognized the man's picture on the news. She called the police and said, that, that's the guy. That's the guy that was bothering me in the restaurant. The suspect, he went in there before he kidnapped Kelsey, and he was being real rude to the waitress that really upset her, and the manager asked him to leave the store. Then the man leaves without paying his bill. And he did like a dine and dash. Upon hearing the news, Detective Miller immediately notifies his suspect. I told him, we're holding on to you. We're going we're gonna to book you for the theft. And so they took him downstairs where he was being booked. And Edwin was literally in custody and laughing at us. He says, this is all you got. This is ridiculous. I'll be out in 48 hours. Meanwhile, across town, investigators are following up on a critical new lead. As soon as Kelsey was reported missing, we immediately started requesting her cell phone records from the wireless carrier. But we were told they were unavailable. We continued to request the records, but it was three days before we got them. Once we did finally get her cell phone records, what we saw was the text that John was sending to Kelsey's phone the evening she went missing. Those texts pinged off of the cell phone towers and proved to be a roadmap. We tracked Kelsey's cell phone pings down the highway in Kansas and into the Missouri side of the metro area. The final ping on her phone was in a wooded area known as Longview Lake. It's a public park where people go to, you know, hike and walk their dogs. And so that's where we concentrated our search for her. 45 minutes into their search, they make a gruesome discovery when they find a female body that was hidden from view. She was covered with branches. 
Her clothes had been taken off. She had a nylon belt around her neck. It appeared as if she'd been strangled with that belt. Although they'll need a DNA test to be sure, the body fits Kelsey's physical description. Then we realize that she's been the victim of a homicide. So now we go into full investigative mode of building our case. Investigators have just discovered the body of a young woman, matching the description of missing teen Kelsey Smith. The Overland Park Police then alert Kelsey's family. We got a phone call that day on June 6th, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that said, hey, we need to come talk to you guys from the police. And I said, okay. So we met him out in the driveway as soon as they got to the house. Captain Fredrickson said, you need to brace yourself. They told us that they'd recovered Kelsey and that she was dead. And um, I just started screaming, not my Kels, not my Kels, but it was my Kels. DNA testing later confirms the family's worst fears. The victim is Kelsey Smith. Once we realized that she's been the victim of a homicide, we knew that we had a very viable suspect in Edwin Hall, who was being interviewed by investigators at the same time. Shortly after getting the news that Kelsey's body has been discovered, the lab sends Detective Miller some pressing new evidence. When Edwin was on his way out to the county jail for the theft, I had to run down to the car and stop him. They matched his thumbprint on the back of the driver's seat seatbelt buckle in Kelsey's car. I let Edwin know that he was now going to be charged with kidnapping and murder. And that's when he screamed in my face. He was just, he was livid. The next few days were just a blur. We were heartbroken, but there was also kind of relief that we had actually found her. After Edwin is arrested, the... Examination of Kelsey's body revealed that she had been sexually assaulted. They ruled the cause of death as being by strangulation. Edwin was charged with murder in the first degree. He was also charged with rape and sodomy. It wasn't until a year and a half later that we go to trial Edwin decides to plead guilty to the charges in order to avoid the the death penalty. As part of the plea, Hall agrees to answer some lingering questions. It was a long time coming for the family to learn what happened to Kelsey during her last moments that night. What he told us was that after he sees Kelsey, then from that moment on, he was hunting her. We ended up finding out it was kind of a violent takeover. He rushes in with this pistol and shoves it in the back of her neck. And his words to her was, if you cooperate, I won't harm you. I just need you to drive. A terrified Kelsey complies not realizing her life would soon come to an end. Edmund Hall was 
sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Justice had been served. I'm very grateful to everybody that, that worked the case because they all did a great job. With the murder case behind him, Greg will forever cherish the time he spent with his daughter just hours before she disappeared. June 2nd, 2007 started out as a fantastic day. I had all the kids and we went to a festival every year called Old Shawnee Days. So we spent the day there riding the rides. Kelsey had convinced us to get on the Ferris wheel and her sister, Lindsay's like screaming and covering her face. Kelsey would turn around and look at me and just laugh. And uh, so, you know, we just, we had a great time. And so that was, that was the last trip. That was the last time we were all, all together um, before she was killed. As for Megan, she'll always miss her best friend. Getting married was really hard without Kelsey. And literally right before I walked down the aisle, Missy brought me this little charm thing to hang on my bouquet that had pictures of me and Kelsey on either side. And then I ugly cried really hard. She's like, no, like, don't do that. So she was definitely incorporated. Missy will always be grateful for the moment she shared with Kelsey just before she disappeared. And I was fortunate enough to talk to Kels. She was at Target. She's getting this gift for John. I said, I love you. And that's the last words that I ever spoke to her. Sometimes I just, um, just wish I could talk to her. Um, I miss her. I know she knows that we miss her. <laughs>